All right, morning, everyone. Good morning. morning, how's everyone doing? Good? All right, welcome back, everyone. Hope everyone had a nice, uh, nice. Uh, any questions from last on the appointment power and the removal power? Anything in your mind? Nothing? Okay. So today, I want to focus on a clause of the Constitution that uh, historically people haven't paid much attention to. Uh, but in recent years, weeks and months really, um, this clause has become very, very significant. And that clause is the take care clause of the Constitution. So if you go to page 30 of your little constitutions, as we, as we often do, um, I want to focus today on this duty with respect to several key current events. Immigration, which is what I asked you to read about. I will also talk about various aspects of the Affordable Care Act. We'll discuss Obamacare later, but I want to talk about it now in the context of the Take Care Clause. And the theme that I want to develop today is how do we understand the Take Care Clause in the context of a gridlock Congress? All right. So this class, will, this class will be fairly heavy on current events, and I'll fill you in everything you need to know. But um, this is not something that has been a big issue in the past, which is why your book has almost nothing on it. Uh, but it will be before the Supreme Court this year and probably next year. Okay? So that's what I want to accomplish for today. So we start, as we always do with the text. So Article 2, Section 3. Right, the very last part, he, the president, right, the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Historically, this clause has been cited by the president as a reason why Congress can't get in his way. Okay, where have we seen this before? Last class, in the very last class, the president said, wait a minute, I need the power to remove officials. I don't want to have this. I can't face this if this guy is trying to get in my way. So in this sense, presidents have historically cited this take care clause as a reason why they should have more power and as a reason why Congress shouldn't step on their turf. But at heart, in these cases, the president is always trying to execute the law. Okay? But what happens when something else happens? What happens when the president doesn't care for the law? What happens when the president wants Congress to change the law, but they don't? What remedies exist in such a case? Okay. I have a little presentation. I usually don't like presentations, but I'll do a little bit of lecturing today because, again, this is a fairly novel topic and there's not much reading on it. You guys are getting the cutting edge. Uh, uh, and I don't, I don't say that lightly. This, there's probably no other constitutional law classroom in the country that has this discussion. So you are you're getting something, uh, uh, something unique for sure. So what do we have today? Well, we have a fairly divided government, right? We have the Congress and the president who don't get along very much. There's always this sense of gridlock and traffic in Washington. The uh, political parties seem to and they're always butting their heads at every single move. So, whereas in the past, right, you had bipartisan members of Congress willing to work together. Today, that's decreasingly the case. I don't know if any of you have read, but for the first time basically in American history, there's not a single senator from the South who's a Democrat. Not one. This is the first time since the Civil War that's happened. Okay? Our society has become increasingly polarized. 
And often the blame is put on Washington, but I, I would humbly submit that that's merely a reflection of the American people themselves, that the American people do not agree on a lot of things. So what happens to Washington when the members of Congress don't agree on the most basic things? Whereas in the past, you get along to get along, you compromise. Whereas today, that may not happen. So let's think of a case we discussed uh, in the last two classes, the Noel Canning case, right? This was a case involving whether members should be appointed to this board, this National Labor Relations Board. And you might remember they needed five members to keep their, I'm sorry, three members to keep their quorum. If they dropped below three, they couldn't shut down. In recent years, as a way to oppose the president's labor policies, both Republicans and Democrats have taken to the strategy of trying to block appointments to this board. So then rather than having three members, they keep it to two, and they can't do anything. Perhaps in a well-functioning Congress, members would say, okay, you know what? We'll just confirm whoever, right? We'll confirm this guy, Craig Becker, even though we don't like him, because the board needs to exist. The board needs to transact business. But there was a massive fight over Becker, as we discussed. And his nomination was blocked. And as a result, the board was threatened to drop below three members. We read that the president made this recess appointment, right? But he did it during a three-day break in the Senate. Was this three-day break sufficient? I showed you the video. Congress came in for about 30 seconds. They gaveled in. They said a few words. They gaveled out. Was that actually a recess? Well, it was an open question. The government's lawyers, the government's lawyers told him, yeah, it's a recess. Go for it. Appoint these three people to the board and give yourself a full membership. Congress wasn't happy about this. But who filed the lawsuit? Was it Congress? No. Congress generally does not have the power to sue the president when he violates the Constitution. Who sued the president? The Noel Canning Corporation. This was the Pepsi bottler from Yakima, Washington, who said, wait a minute, you can't issue a judgment against us. You don't have enough members in your board. <coughs> so think about this for a second. In almost every single separation of powers case that you studied. You haven't said that many, but in all the ones that you studied, who has the plaintiff been? Well, the Youngstown Sound Tube Company, they were a private company, and their, their bills were taken over, right? United States v. Myers, right? He was some guy trying to collect his salary, saying, listen, I, I'm due a salary. Humphrey's executor, same deal. Some guy was saying, listen, pay me money because I'm supposed to be in my office as a commissioner of the FTC. Morrison versus Olson. You have a guy named Ted Olson say, hey, wait a minute, you're prosecuting me for this crime, but you as a prosecutor are unconstitutional. Every single instance, every separation of powers case we've done has been where some sort of private person who is getting bothered by the government in some way for a lawsuit. So in this sense, the separation of powers, in the courts at least, hasn't been litigated by Congress. Now, Congress is lurking in the background. They filed briefs in support of these cases, but the parties haven't been Congress. And what happened, Noel Canning? We say this case last week. The Supreme Court unanimously ruled that you can't make these recess appointments. That violates the separation of powers. Right? And we went back and forth with Justice Scalia, and they kind of disagreed on it. But one aspect where the court agreed was the role of intransigence. We discussed this. Justice Kagan said, listen to the president, you're not using these recess appointments as a way to deal with Congress being out of town as an absence. What you're actually doing is using this to deal with congressional intransigence. Right? This is the gridlock that we're talking about. In a normal, well-functioning Congress, if the president nominates someone to this board, He'll get a vote, and he'll probably go up. But in the last decade, 
senators from both parties have began filibustering even those routine nominations to various boards. Now you may ask yourself, who broke the Constitution first, right? On the one hand, you could say, well, the senators acted unreasonably by blocking these nominations, right? That they have an obligation to vote for whoever the president appoints. And the other side may be, well, the president puts forward names, and if they say no, that's the end of the story. So this question, though, is tougher than it may seem. Does the Senate have an obligation to approve the president's nominees? Does the Congress have any obligation to enact laws? Now, this may surprise you, but in the text of the Constitution, the answer is no. The Constitution says the Senate may give advice and consent. Do they have to? No. But because they are withholding their consent, perhaps unreasonably, the president takes things into his own hands. So did you study it towards the doctrine of self-help or contracts? No? Okay. You'll, you'll study this probably this semester then. So say you're a landlord, right? And you're renting out your apartment to someone. And the person doesn't pay rent. What do you do? Well, under modern law, you would file papers with the court to evict the person, right? And this is a fairly lengthy process. You need to give notice. You have to post something on his wall, whatever, right? But at common law, what did you do? You change the locks and you sell the stuff. This is what's called self-help. Under the common law, a remedy was to take the law into your own hands, right? If the other party breached their contract or breached their lease, you could go in there change the locks, sell his stuff, okay? This is, this is called self-help. So it's interesting to analogize the separation of powers to self-help, right? On the one hand, you had the, pre you had the Congress acting unreasonably, saying, listen, we're not gonna nominate any of your people because we wanna shut down this board. So the president says, you know what? All right, we, we, we can make this work. If you guys are gonna mess up the separation of powers, we're going to mess it up more. In other words, if you are, if the Congress is going to expand their role, expand their power, then the president will do so as well to fix that gridlock. So in Noel Canning, what did the Solicitor General say? And this was a very important session. This recess power acts as a safety valve for intransigence. In other words, when Congress acts unreasonably, the president can engage in this kind of self-help. He can change the lock, so to speak. He can sell the, sell the tenant stuff. Right? Is, is there a safety valve? Can the president simply let steam out of Congress when they don't agree? Is it a little teapot, short and stout, right? Handle and spout. Can he simply do this? So we discussed this in the context of the removal of the appointment power, right? But let's think about this with respect to the separation of powers itself. What happens when one branch does too much? Madison wrote, ambition must check ambition, right? When Congress gets too ambitious, can the president fight back? Right? The Supreme Court seemed to say no. The Supreme Court seemed to say that this is a very aggressive expansion of power. It was just Salito. And I think I mentioned this in class last time, but the Chief Justice made the point that the Senate has a right not to confirm anyone. By the way, Barack Obama voted against him. So uh, uh, there might have been some history there. But I think what we'll find in this class is that the Constitution imposes on the President a lot of duties. You shall do this. You shall do that. Congress doesn't, I'm sorry, the Constitution does not impose any duties on the Congress, right? 
Congress doesn't have to do anything, which, which might blow some of your minds, but we'll walk through the text of the Constitution in a few moments. Congress has no affirmative obligations. So then how do we understand it? Where the president wants Congress to do X, whatever X is, and Congress says no. How is the president supposed to react to this? Well, as we know from Youngstown, the president can't make law by himself. His only options are to enforce the laws that have already been enacted. Okay? But what happens when Congress, sorry, what happens when the president wants to change laws and Congress says no? Right? What happens when the president says, this law is broken and we need to fix it? And Congress does not agree. So in Noel Canning, Justice Breyer addressed this, right? When you have a gridlock Congress that won't agree with the president's agenda, this is a political problem, not a constitutional problem, right? So what happens? The president says, law X is broken. We need to fix it. And then Congress does nothing to fix it. What's the political remedy? Elections. Elections. The president has what Teddy Roosevelt called a bully pulpit. He has a bully pulpit. At the next midterm elections, you can say to the American people, this law is broken and Congress won't fix it. Throw the bums out. Throw the bums out. Elections have consequences. If people forget that on both sides, right? Elections have consequences. But instead, there has been a disquieting pattern um, in the last number of years where the executive is effectively taking the position that in the absence of congressional action, he'll take matters into his own hands. And, and this has been a fairly uh, uh, transparent approach. Uh, there's, there's not much been a secret about this. <laughs> Um, uh, the president has called this his pen and phone approach. So what I want you to get from this is not necessarily whether he's acting right or wrong. What I want to focus on is how the branches check each other when the separation of powers get perhaps out of whack, right? Where in a reasonable Congress, laws that enjoy popular support would get passed. But today, when there's so much, so much fracturing, most laws aren't getting passed. So what can the president do in that absence? <laughs> or to state the issue very clearly, does gridlock license the president to take executive action? Does gridlock give the president some additional justification to engage in executive action? <laughs> this is an important question, which is as old as Youngstown and Justice Jackson. But we'll decide, I think, some of the most important constitutional issues of our day. Okay? So here are a number of quotes from the president. These, these are verbatim quotes. I put them in meme form because I don't like putting text into PowerPoint. But what's a meme doesn't look like text. So the president says something like this. I take executive action when we have a serious problem and Congress chooses to do nothing. So let's, let's unpack this for a second, right? Serious problem. Who gets to decide when there's a serious problem? Uh, I mean, you can make arguments both ways. On the one hand, the president can say, here, we have a problem. We need to do something. I think on the other hand, you have to say, well, the legislatures who are responsible for making laws decide whether there's actually a problem. In other words, this isn't a clear-cut issue. Often people disagree with whether there's a problem. The second part of the statement, I think, is perhaps more contestable. Congress chooses to do no nothing. This may blow your minds, right? When Congress votes no on something, they're doing something. When Congress votes against a bill, they're doing something. They're, de they're declining to enact the law. I think all too often today there's this presumption 
that unless a bill is passed, Congress is not doing the right thing. You see all these headlines, the most least productive Congress in American history, they passed the fewest bills. Why is it that the measure of a congressional success is passing bills? What if these bills are something Congress doesn't want? What if the body is so fractured that there's not enough consensus for these bills? Then perhaps doing nothing <coughs> is a reflection of the intent of the body. But in any event, the president's made clear that he sees no new laws, not passing bills, as a justification for action. Right? On the flip side, conservatives say, you know what? We're not going to pass any bills. We don't want to do anything. OK? But gridlock itself, gridlock itself is the outcome when the members of Congress do not agree. And it's very difficult to get members of Congress to pass laws when they don't agree. Now, if any of you have seen this, this poster, I, they littered it all over the building by the elevators. This is my flyer for my seminar. Uh, but Scalia says it very clearly, right? When we have gridlock, it means the Constitution is working, right? When we have gridlock in Washington, it means it's working. Our system isn't designed to pass laws where people don't agree. We don't have a parliamentary system where laws can be passed very quickly. There are a lot of hoops you have to jump through to get there. I think we explained this in the very first or second day of class, right? What has to happen for a law to be passed? Well, it has to be introduced in one house, has to be introduced in another. Both houses have to agree, subject to a filibuster. Then the president has to sign it. That's has to be subject to a constitutional challenge, or all these gates, if you will, for laws can be enacted. But in the absence of clearing all those gates, our Constitution effectively maintains the status quo. Now, you may not like that. Maybe you want a new law. Maybe you think the law is broken or there's a new <coughs> policy. Fine. Uh, and and I, I, I think many laws are, are quite bad. <coughs> But the mere fact that nothing's happening, I think, is a reflection of the fact that there isn't enough consensus in Congress. And I gave you this number before about partyism, where nowadays people don't want their kid marrying someone of a different party, right? I told you about this? People would more, are more comfortable with their child engaging in interracial marriage and interparty marriage, which is both happy and sad at the same time. So let's actually think, though, right? This clause, which we keep coming back to, and I put, I put George Washington there because I have a George Washington quote at the beginning of the article I gave you. Um, the word shall is there. And you study this in all of your classes. Shall means must. You read a contract and it says the party shall do something. That imposes an obligation on the parties to do something. If it says the parties may do something, well, that's an option. Right? If certain conditions are met, there's an option. But shall, shall means must. Congress, on the other hand, right? Remember how a bill becomes a law? Does Congress have a duty to pass laws? No. No, they don't. And, and I know this is a very difficult image for people to understand, but I want you to focus on this. Congress does not have to pass laws. They may have a civic duty to do so, but there's no constitutional obligation to do so. And to the extent that they act in a stupid or foolish manner, which they often do, this is fixed to the ballot box. All right. Uh, the president's also made another point, uh, and he's repeated this a number of times. Uh, we can't afford to wait for Congress. I'm going ahead and moving without them. Uh, he's actually made this something of a mantra, uh, the we can't wait mantra. If you go on online, you can buy these little buttons that say, we can't wait. And there's a website. And then there's a website listing all the instances where, uh, where we can't wait. Okay. Our democracy, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Our republic wasn't designed to operate efficiently. It's perhaps one of the least efficient democracies in the world by design. And this is a point made in INS Fichata by Chief Justice Berger and more recently Justice Scalia in Noel Canning. 
right? Convenience and efficiency are great. Having laws pass quickly, that's fun. But that's not the objective of our Constitution. And this is an incontrovertible point, right? We don't live in a country where laws can be passed right away. And if I may add, when laws are passed quickly, they're usually very bad. Think of laws passed in reaction to tragedies, the Patriot Act, or anything else you want. When you pass a law quickly that no one reads and no one thinks about much, there's a lot of problems. Okay? So, so deliberation is a good thing. Rushing laws through is not always a good thing. In the absence of laws, you stay put. Okay? And so one final point the president makes, and he's repeated this a number of times, is as long as they, meaning Congress, insists on obstruction, I'll keep taking action on my own. And I think you can read this two different ways, right? One way is like, listen, if they're not going to pass the laws I want, I'm going to do something by myself. But I think the other way of reading it, which I think is perhaps more likely, is that because they're not acting, I can do X. In other words, in the absence of this gridlock, I, I don't have the power to do this, but because of this gridlock, I'm actually enabled to go ahead and do this. This is the safety valve argument. Because of this gridlock, I can use my executive power to let out a little bit of steam, right? Because Congress won't enact immigration law, I can go ahead and uh, defer deportations for millions of people. Okay? All of this is more or less recent, although there have been shades of it in the past. Uh, uh, there have been reports that President George W. Bush wasn't particularly eager to enforce various uh, environmental laws and otherwise. So th this, is, this has been going on for years. Uh, but I think it's really come to a head in the last five, six years because of this polarization between the President and Congress, which I think is worse than anything I've ever seen before in my, uh, uh, my experience. So how do we understand this? I think we have to take a trip back to Youngstown, all right? At its heart, what was Youngstown about? Who can make the laws, the president or Congress? Who can authorize the seizure of steel mills, the president or Congress? Truman said, I can do it myself. I can have all the steel mills, right? <laughs> there it is. Oh, to wake you up, guys, it's already 9.30, come on. Pep up, pep up. I can have all the steel mills, right? Supreme Court said, Nope. And what did Jackson say, right? What's interesting about Justice, this is Justice Robert Jackson. Justice Jackson said, listen, this isn't just a question over whether you have the inherent power to seize a steel mill. This is about how do you relate to Congress? Are you acting consistently with Congress, right? Recall in this case that after the president seized the steel mills, Congress was quiet, right? They didn't say anything. They didn't say yes. They didn't say no. So what did Jackson do? He went back and looked at previous laws and said, did Congress give you this power? Ultimately, Jackson said, no. The president, you got your lowest ebb, right? You're not in the twilight zone. You're at your lowest ebb. There's no water. The boat's docked. You're screwed. Right? So Youngstown wasn't a take care clause case exactly, but it was. If the president is not executing laws, then he is making laws. Right? If you have the duty to execute laws and you're doing something else, that means you're making the law yourself. I think it's a fairly simple tautology, uh, but it's important. Everything the president does must be according to law. And unless he's acting based on his inherent powers, which may be the case, he's engaging in lawmaking. And the question of whether he's actually engaging in lawmaking requires a close study of if he's acting with the consent of Congress. Because if he's acting with the backing of Congress, as, Ju as Jackson says, well, you know, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, it's probably okay. But if he's acting against the will of Congress, he's acting all by himself. He's, gauge, he's engaging in unconstitutional lawmaking. Okay? Everyone with me so far? 
Any questions so far? No? Okay, I'll keep going. So what I want to discuss with you is a couple aspects of presidential lawmaking in a context where the president and Congress simply do not agree. Okay? The first one will be about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Um, the second one will be about immigration, including two recent immigration policies that are uh, in the courts as we speak. In fact, I was hoping the court would have decided it by this week, which is why I held off on giving the readings, but uh, the court hasn't decided yet, so it'll probably come next week. Perfect timing for this class, right? So the first uh, aspect I want to discuss is something we'll focus on at length in a few weeks, which is the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate. And we'll discuss this at, at, at great length later. But the way the Affordable Care Act was designed was to require young and healthy people like yourself to buy health insurance, right? Why does the law make all of you young and healthy people buy insurance? To subsidize poor and sick people. Um, there's, not a, there's not a secret about this. The way Obamacare works is by spreading the wealth, so to speak. It takes people who are young and healthy, makes them buy insurance, put money to the system, and that makes afford uh, insurance more affordable for the older and sicker people. I mean, it might sound callous, but this is, this is how the law was signed. Okay? But this wasn't how the law was sold. Right? Um, this may have happened to some of you in this room, but in the fall of 2013, uh, millions of people received cancellation notices <laughs> saying that your insurance policy is canceled, right? Why were the policies canceled? Because the Affordable Care Act sets a very high bar for what qualified insurance is. It has to pay for birth control, has to pay for contraception, you know, has to pay for various expensive treatments, etc. So if people before had, you know, kind of cheap, catastrophic plans, these are the kinds of plans that only cover if, like, you get sent to the emergency room, right? These kinds of plans were not compliant with Obamacare. As a result, they're canceled. Again, this is not a mystery. Anyone who knew anything about Obamacare knew this was coming. The problem was the president said more times than I can count uh, that if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Um, this, this was never true. It could never be true. In fact, they knew millions would lose their insurance. Um, and this isn't just black men talking. The political, political fact, which is like a site checker for the internet, uh, effectively said this was the lie of the year. Uh, because it says pants on fire. So it wasn't true. And, and that's not important. I don't really care about that, that aspect of it. What is significant is what happened after the policies were canceled. New York Times front page, reversal, Obama moves to avert cancellation policies. Right? So the law was working as it was designed. The law which bears his name was working as designed. People who had these cheap bare-bone plans were being thrown off them so they can go buy more expensive and comprehensive Obamacare plans. People didn't like this. They weren't happy about it, right? So what would be the correct way, the constitutional way, of fixing this problem? Anyone? What's the correct way of fixing this problem? What? Raise your hand, someone. Yeah. Imagine that. Ask Congress, right? I, I taught this in my seminar last week, and someone said issue an executive order as a way to fix it. That's, that's, not, that's not the right answer, although I'm glad he said that. Yeah. So I, in my, my seminar last week, I taught this, this case, and I said, so how could the president have fixed this? And someone said, and he was a good student, issue an executive order. Um, it pains me. That's, and I don't mean this to criticize him because it was, a, it was a reasonable answer. It pains me that law students think this is the first course of action. That when there's a problem, the first thing to be done is to issue an executive order. Um, this is what scares me. I actually stay awake at night thinking about this. That an entire generation of people will be raised with thinking this is how government works. That when things are going bad, the answer is to the president is to change it himself. And far too many people are quiet about this because they like the policy implications, right? Maybe they like Obamacare. Maybe they like immigration. Maybe they like this or that. Um, as lawyers, you need to separate for yourself as much as you can the policy and the law. I know all too often people say, oh, there is no law. It's all policy, whatever. You're in a class now, right? Try and put on your thinking hats 
and try to separate, regardless of what you think about the Affordable Care Act, regardless of what you think about immigration policy, is this legal? And far too many people stay silent about this because they like the policy implications. So I, I will hope the 70 of you in this room are smarter than that uh, and can at least try. You don't have to even believe it. Maybe at the end of the day you think, oh, it doesn't matter, but try. That's what I force myself to do all the time. There are lots of policies which I like and I think they're unconstitutional. And there are lots of policies I dislike but I think are constitutional. Justice Scalia often says the test for your honesty is can you support a law that you think is terrible but constitutional? So the example Scalia often gives is flag burning. Right? Justice Scalia voted to find that a flag burning law was unconstitutional. It violates the First Amendment. Scalia says, I hate flag burning. I think it's a terrible thing, and people who do it should be beaten up and whatever, right? But he upheld, but he said this law is unconstitutional. So try as best as you can in this class and otherwise to separate the law and the policy. If you learn nothing else from me, maybe you remember that. Okay? So, so did, did the president go to Congress? Of course not, right? What did he do? He issued an executive order that grandfathered old plans. So the law says on January 1st, 2014, roughly a year ago, on January 1st, 2014, all these old plans are void under Obamacare. But you know what? I'm not going to enforce that requirement. Even though the law says anyone who has one of these non-compliant plans has to pay a penalty, I'm going to waive that. You don't have to pay it. If your plan was canceled by Obamacare, you have suffered a hardship, and I will give you an exemption. Think about that for a second. The hardship was caused by the law itself. <laughs> the exemption is to the law. Usually the hardships are for people who are poor and don't have enough money and you know, really low income. But here, the hardship was the law's operating as was designed because plans were canceled. OK? So he issued an executive order. This is currently being challenged in, in, a, in a federal court. <clears throat> but he didn't just issue an executive order. He, the president, effectively declined to enforce the mandate, the law. The, the government took the position that this is a mandate which requires people to buy health insurance. If they don't, they have to pay this penalty. This was the cornerstone of the law, which was not being enforced for an entire year. Why was it not being enforced? Because it proved unpopular. Even though this was a law the president fought tooth and nail for, <laughs> its results proved unpopular. By the way, if any of you are paying your income taxes this year and you do not have insurance, you'll be subject to a penalty. And millions of people are going to suddenly realize, oh, wait a minute, I have to pay a penalty for not having insurance. I think there might be more waivers coming down the pipe, but it, it, this is, it's still early in the tax season. What makes this exemption from the law even more um, egregious <clears throat> is that Congress was also trying to fix it. In the House of Representatives, a bill was proposed called the, it was like the Keep Your Health Insurance Act of 2013 or something like that. The bill was one and a half pages long, really short for Congress. The bill said, any plan that's valid in 2013 will be valid in 2014. In other words, we're gonna grandfather all of your plans. The bill in Congress would have done exactly what the president's executive order did. But of course, it has the force of Congress. Congress makes the laws. What do you think the president did about that bill that passed the House on a bipartisan basis? What do you think he did? Did he support it? Did he say the Senate should pass this bill? What do you think he did? Anyone know? Don't take a guess. He threatened to veto it. He threatened to veto the very bill that would have accomplished what his executive order did. Right? He threatened to veto a law that would have allowed people to keep their plans, even though he did it himself. Um, yeah. Lois said, right? Yeah. Because he said it would sabotage the Affordable Care Act. I think his exact words were either sabotage or something like that. That's why I have the picture of them chiseling it. 
Yeah, the, the veto threat said it would sabotage the law. So how do we understand this, right? Let, let's, let's throw the lawyer's hat on for a second, right? The law was working as designed, the law was designed to cancel plans, and it did this. He decided not to enforce the Obamacare penalty because it was unpopular. And then when Congress tried to pass a law that would have accomplished just that, he tried to veto it. Uh, it's very hard to defend the legality of this action. Um, I, I can't think of a good answer, and I, I, I've been studying this issue for quite a while. Uh, the government's claimed it has discretion to perhaps not apply and find various exemptions, but the exemption it's carved out was for millions of people who were suffering because the law was operating as it's supposed to. I think perhaps the most egregious aspect of this is that Congress was attempting to fix this. They wanted to fix it, and because the president didn't agree with them, I'm not sure what, the fact that anything could be changed with Obamacare, he vetoed it. So un under Jackson's analysis, it's, it's, it's very tough to find this anywhere but the lowest ebb, or maybe even below the lowest ebb. You know, if you dig down to the muck over there, I mean, that's where you find the Obamacare delays. Um, but that wasn't the only delay of the Affordable Care Act. So there's something else in Obamacare called, oh, any questions? When I lecture, I sometimes forget to stop. Any questions? Okay. All right, so there's another aspect of the Affordable Care Act called the Obamacare Employer Mandate. All right, what is this Obamacare Employer Mandate? It says if you're a business and you have more than 50 employees, you're required to provide health insurance to your employees. And if you don't, you pay a penalty. This is generally how Obamacare works. You have to do something if you don't, you pay a penalty. That's, that's the general gist of how the law works. Uh, but this provision proved to be very, very um, unpopular. Small businesses did not like this. They didn't. And small businesses started lobbying the president saying, wait a minute, we don't want, we don't want this. We can't handle this. Push it off. Delay it. Delay it. Delay it. So again, you have a provision of the law which is unpopular. What do you do? go to Congress. You fix the law with Congress. And in fact, Congress had several bills that would have delayed or even repealed the employer mandate. Did the president support those bills? No. He said, can we fix it? Yes, we can. We can do this ourselves. You like Bob the Builder, right? And so what happened was the employer mandate was delayed. Not once, but twice. It was kicked back first till 2014, and then again till 2016. So the very mandate which they said was essential for the law was effectively delayed for two years, until after the election, I, 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 may, I may add. Right? Does the president have the power to do this? Uh, again, they claim various transitional relief to make these various policies. But at heart, he's not enforcing various aspects of the law. The law says the mandate shall go into effect on January 1st, 2014. Otherwise, you pay penalties. And he's simply not collecting them. Now, I think, again, we're here in our lowest ebb. But let me ask a question, right? What can Congress do about it? Right? This is, this is the difficult question of the Take Care Clause. When the president decides that he's not going to enforce various aspects of the law, what can Congress do about it? Let's take the individual mandate, right? First, we've discussed you can only file a lawsuit in court when you're injured, right? When something hurts you. But when the president says, I am not going to charge you a penalty, is anyone injured? Think about that for a second. If the president says, I am not charging you a penalty, have you suffered an injury? No. When the president exempts you from the law, you are by definition not injured. And because you haven't suffered an injury, you can't go to federal court to sue. This isn't like Meyer, who was suing for a salary, or Humphrey, who was suing for a salary. 
for Youngstown that was suing because their mills were taken over. Here, the president is not enforcing the law. Can you sue when you're not being fined? And the answer is no. Same thing for the small businesses, right? When the president exempts very small businesses from this law, they're not being fined. Is anyone suffering an injury? No. And because no one is suffering an injury, <clears throat> is there any party who can bring a lawsuit? Maybe. Probably not. Maybe. I don't know. I go back and forth on this one. I'll discuss this in a minute. What I want you to focus on is the danger of non-enforcement is that there's not judicial review. When the president declines to enforce the law, no one is getting injured. And when no one is getting injured, no one has what's called standing. They don't have standing to bring a case or controversy in federal court. I want to understand that point. It's an important point that, that, that often gets lost. So in our system of checks and balances, what check is there when the president violates a take care clause? <coughs> what is the check on the president when he does not comply with his duty under the take care clause? Okay. Impeachment. All right. When the president does not comply with the take care clause, he's impeached. Short of impeachment, what other remedies are there? Think. Pass another law. What if he doesn't enforce that one either? I'm, I'm not being pedantic, right? Or what if he vetoes it? If the issue is that he's not enforcing it, if he changed the law that it doesn't exist, then there's no reason for him not enforcing it. Will that be giving in to the president? Isn't the reason why they're not changing the law in the first place because they want that law to be in effect? In other words, so what he said was, the president doesn't want to enforce law X, right? You said remove law X? But Congress wants to keep law X. You see the point? They want to keep law X. They want to be enforced. I'm not talking about this issue in particular, right? If Congress passed a law one year ago, five years ago, 50 years ago, whatever it is, right? And it's still in the books, Congress wants to be enforced. Uh, what about a writ of mandamus? Oh, what do you mean a writ of mandamus? Um, <laughs> compelling the president to enforce the law. Through the Where have we seen a writ of mandamus? Which case was that? Amazon. So what, what, what happened in Marbury, right? This is, it's very good that you raised that, because actually you're, you're in the right ballpark, okay? William Marbury was denied a commission. He suffered an injury. He's like, here, I want my job. I want to go work as a justice of the peace. So he sued for mandamus, which is effectively an order to force the executive to act. So he sued to get the court to say to James Madison, give him his petition. Okay? Marbury was injured, right? There was an injury there. But the more important question is, could a, for, could a court have forced Jefferson to give him the commission? Marshall said yes. Uh, Jefferson would have probably ignored it. But you're on the right track. Can the president, yeah? Congress? Congress Not there yet. Getting there. Can a court force the president to enforce the law? Can a court force the president to enforce the law? I think. He said mandamus, right? Tell President Jefferson to give Marbury's petition, his commission. Anyone, what do you think? Yeah. Well, Marbury was about, um, at one level, finding the wrong court. Right, but what was the other part? That was the third part of the opinion. What was the first two parts? Well, I mean, the other part was about whether or not the commission was valid or not. Did, Mar did Marshall say that if there was jurisdiction, could could they have issued it? If there was jurisdiction, could they have issued the writ? Yeah. So it's a very outset of our country. 
Chief Justice Marshall said, yeah, we can tell the president what to do. And in the same way that the Youngstown court told the president, don't take those mills, what did he do? He relinquished them. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I'm kind of confused because I thought the, the court, I thought it was under Congress to enforce the laws, not its. Who is, what's the duty of the president? The president shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. So whose duty is it to enforce the laws? Hmm? Congress. Uh, where, where does oh, Congress? Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah, president. The president. Do you get that? Yeah, I get that. Okay. Is there a follow up or? Yeah. Elliot? Um, aren't the, like, the circumstances pretty different from the village in Marbury to the village in Pleasant Bay where a writ of mandate is not actually work? Do I actually compel the president to enforce the laws? So you think today the president would comply with an order to. Uh... You're saying I don't think that there's a risk of the civil war. Well, I don't know. We're in Texas here. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of agree with Elliot. I think our country is a lot more stable. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. Let me ask another question. All right. So we've had a couple of different thoughts, right? How do how does what happens when the president does not faithfully execute the laws? Well, someone said impeachment, and there's always impeachment on the table. Uh, someone said perhaps a lawsuit. We'll get to Congress in a minute, but generally, when there's non enforcement, there are no private parties to bring this lawsuit. What other tools does Congress have? to require the president to enforce the law, short of impeachment. Um, take away his budget. Good. Well, how does that work? Well, Congress has the power of the terms. Right. So when budgets come up, and they come up regularly so that, so that the government can function, they just slash it, and then there's nothing the president can do. OK, so, so this is the classic power of the purse example, right? If the president is doing something Congress doesn't like, Congress can defund the president, right? This is what is often known as a government shutdown. And we had one of these uh, about a year ago, where uh, it was actually over Obamacare. Your, your junior senator, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, had a 23-hour filibuster, which was pretty re remarkable from an endurance perspective. <laughs> By the way, Ted Cruz was a Supreme Court advocate for he was a senator. He was, he was really good. If you want to listen to some good arguments, go look up his Supreme Court arguments. They were excellent. Uh, she might not like him, but he was an advocate. He was fantastic. And the government shut down because no budget was passed. And then we see that the parks close, and you know the soldiers are trying to get into the war memorials. They put the yellow tape, and you know, or, you know, we forget about those, right? People dumping barricades at the White House. You know, it was a year ago, but it happened, right? The president. Didn't blink. But defunding the government is very broad, right? What if the president is doing one thing the Congress doesn't like? Does that require defunding the entire government? Right? Does that require putting you know millions of federal employees on furlough out of a job? So in many respects, the politics make impeachment and defunding impractical. Not to say that they're not their options. Of course, you can always impeach. But as a matter of politics, it's hard to remove the president because you need two thirds in the Senate, and his own party will, will support him. So that's not going to happen. And when you start defunding stuff, people start getting hurt. People don't get their paychecks and otherwise. Right? So this brings us to the question which Morgan asked is who else can bring suit? And this is the $64,000 question that we have today. So we'll get to immigration in a moment. Let's stay on Obamacare for a second. The House of Representatives, led by Speaker John Boehner, brought a lawsuit challenging the executive branch's failure to enforce the uh, failure to force Obamacare. The House of Representatives brought a suit challenging the failure of the executive branch to enforce the, the Obamacare mandate. Can 
or should, oh, sorry, should, should Congress be able to do this? Anyone? Should, I'm not saying can they, let's start with should. Should Congress do this? Tell me why. Who brought lawsuit? Who? But who is the injured party here? When, well, uh, uh, who's injured when the president does not charge people Obamacare penalties? Who's injured? How is Congress injured? Is that an injury? Can Congress claim an injury when the president doesn't force laws? Well, what about the small business employees? What are their health insurance and their employees? That's a very good question, but under Obamacare, they get it from the government. In other words, under Obamacare, if your employer doesn't give it to you, you can go to the Obamacare exchange and get it anyway. So there's actually not much of an injury. How is this not a balance of powers thing? Because Congress has the ability to tax All right. and Obama is preventing them from collecting taxes. Well, that's the same, that's a similar point to what Morgan said, right? The president's not enforcing the law that was enacted. Congress is, being injured. is it an injury? This is the question. Is it an injury when the president does not enforce the laws that Congress enacted? Hector. I guess if you consider like a fiduciary or an agent, mm. not Someone read the article. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm going, I'll get there in a few minutes, right? No one else? Honey? You're essentially usurping the power that they have to create laws, and if, if they're not enforced, then what do they do? Okay. So what I'm sensing from all of you is saying that by not enforcing the laws, the press has <laughs> basically usurped or, 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 or nullified the, uh, the legislative role to enact laws, okay? The flip side to this, and the question which has been on my mind for the last six months or so, is what happens now every time Congress doesn't like what the president does, so they go to court? Right? Would it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll assume arguendo, like I, I will assume with you for a moment that the president violates the separation of powers by not enforcing Obamacare. I will make that assumption for the moment. But does this further disrupt the separation of powers to bring the courts and Congress into this mix? Should it not be a political remedy Impeachment, defunding, or term limits. He only has four years to go. Anyone? Thoughts? Anyone, anyone think this is a bad idea? Lawsuits by the House represents it. Why do you think it's a bad idea? Because it introduces a new way to solve problems that have never been used before. So I mean, create a whole new precedent for approaching complex issues. We say, well, let's just bring in. Judiciary to yes, they have judicial review, but is that mandated? Anyone else? I agree with Zach. I feel like if if this is sort of going to open the gates, and now that Congress is going to, I feel like that un, that kind of unbalances the, the check. I mean, the president essentially disagrees with Congress, and then there's a great lock. But this is sort of a way to go around that group. Diana. Yeah. I, I disagree. I think that the that through Marbury and Chris Madison, we learned that the reason we have judicial review is to keep the other branches in check. And uh -huh. so it is the highest law, it, it serves that purpose to make sure that the two branches are acting within their scope. And when they step out of line, that's why we have judicial review. Okay. Hector? I mean, I'm not really sure if it's good or, or bad, but I would say that it does seem to be something new, like what Zach said, as far as I know, because it, there's a fine line between saying something that what you've done is unconstitutional, and then, I guess, bringing a suit for what, like specific performance? Or and that, that's, the, that's the important issue, right? What is the remedy? What is the remedy? Someone said before, can John Marshall order... Thomas Jefferson to hand out the commission to Marbury, right? Can the Supreme Court order 
the president to charge an Obamacare penalty. Think about that. Could, could a court issue specific performance, use your words, right? Could a court order the president to act? It seems like a mandamus. Yeah. Would the president be free? Would, would there be a problem of the executive or the president? Like the only way that he could really be tried would be impeachment. Well, to be precise, they're not suing the president directly. They're suing the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So it's actually not the president directly. It's not Boehner versus Obama. It's Boehner versus Burwell. But, but you're on the right track, right? Can the court force the president to do something? Wouldn't that also remove the check in that the president has the discretion to not enforce the law? Is that all and the here reason? is leading to what I hope you read in the article <laughs> concerning discretion, right? With respect to Obamacare, it's pretty clear that he's not complying with the law. And I, I say that this is somewhat of a partisan. I've written a book on this. I have experience with this, so I'm not entirely unbiased. But the, the arguments in favor of the president are very weak. Even people who agree with Obamacare say he acted unlawfully. I think it's a much more difficult question whether the courts get involved. But let's move on to immigration, where I think the issue on the take care clause is a lot closer. A lot closer. And, and for full disclosure, I, uh, I wrote a brief in support of the lawsuit filed by Texas which I'll discuss in a few minutes, so I do have a position on this, but I will, I will engage the classroom in a, a neutral discussion as best as I can. Do you remember separate law and politics, right? So we have something called the DREAM Act, which maybe you may have read about or heard about or, or know about. The DREAM Act, in effect, says uh, uh, minors who came to this country with their parents or otherwise who were not admitted legally have been here for a number of years have gone to school, gotten a diploma, they should not be considered legal, right? They should be provided some sort of pathway to citizenship for the reason that they weren't culpable. They came here as minors, it wasn't their decision to come here, and since they've been here, they've been at, you know, accepted society, they've gone to school, they've you know, done all these wonderful things. And as a matter of policy, the DREAM Act seems very sensible, by the way, in any protest, always spot the Che Guevara sign right there. Everyone see it? It's always there, I promise. <laughs> always there. If you don't know who Che Guevara is, Google him. Or ask your classmates. We left. Yep. <laughs> so the DREAM Act was introduced in Congress, I think a total of 11 times. And each time, it was defeated. Uh, it was most recently uh, a brought for a vote in 2011. And if I remember correctly, it came up one vote short. In other words, the House passed it, and it came up one vote short in the Senate, 59 votes. So it didn't break the filibuster. Okay? It was defeated. You know, you may like the policy or not. That's not what we're talking about now. But effectively, Congress did what their constituents want them to do. This law did not achieve the critical mass. All right, so after this law was defeated, about six or seven months later, in June of 2012, uh, the president announced something called Deferred Action, or specifically DACA, uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Everything has a, has a nice acronym in Washington, DACA, right? Okay, so what did DACA do? Well, it couldn't grant citizenship to the dreamers, or the dreamers were the people who came here illegally and they went to high school, whatever, right? It couldn't grant them citizenship outright because Congress needs to grant citizenship. What it did do was it said, if you come forward and sign up for this program, we will not deport you for two years. We will not subject you to deportation for two years. Not only that, because you're under deferred action, you're entitled to work authorization. You can come out of the shadows. You can get a driver's license. You can get work. You can become a full, you know, a full resident, although short of citizenship. And that this two-year period is renewable, right? So for effectively 1.5 million people, these the dreamers, the president said, "We will not deport you." Okay. Now, what was the justification for this policy? Someone said it before, prosecutorial discretion. 
the president says, listen, Congress only gives me enough money to deport roughly, was it 400,000 people a year, whatever, whatever the number is, which is a, fr a small fraction of the number of people who are subject to deportation. In my efforts to conserve resources and use my resources in a smart way, I'm not going to focus on these, on these dreamers because they're good people, right? They went to school. They're embedded into their society. These are not my priorities. These are low priorities. So by coming forward and registering for this policy, we know who we should not be deporting. Okay? So let's think about this one for a second, right? Let's talk about Youngstown first. Right? Are we at the lowest end? Well, I think one way of looking at this is the history of the law. Congress voted against the DREAM Act. They said, by a close margin, these are not, this is not a law we want to enact. These are not people we want to confer benefits on. The vote was close. But as they say, close but no cigar. The president said, okay, even though Congress said these are not people we want to give benefits to, I will use my executive power to confer benefits on these very people. Now, don't think, people say this, it's, it's wrong. Da DACA did not achieve the DREAM Act, right? There's no pathway to citizenship. Uh, people call this amnesty, it's simply wrong. It's not amnesty, it's, 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 it's uh, incorrect. What it does do is give people work permits, a driver's license, and actually exist in, in, in a way that perhaps might be uh, good from a policy perspective, but it's not what Congress wanted. You your hand? Oh, no. Okay. But let's think about the take care clause for a second, right? Is the president faithfully executing the laws when he says that the law is broken, I want Congress to change it, Congress didn't change it, right? And I'm going to do something else anyway. Now you're raising your hand? No. Well, why do you say that? Well, because, uh, first of all, we've seen in each election that the, he's, in a death, he's in a lame duck session. We've seen in each election that people have voted more and more against his party and against his wishes. That's a, I think that's kind of a, a mandate against his wishes to do this. They won re-election, didn't he? Yes, he did. This is it. See, I love. So it's fascinating, right? Uh, uh, you make a correct point where the president's effectively lost seats in Congress each time, but he was reelected. So I mean, that's something of a wash. But by, by giving these uh, these citizens like this legal status, it's not it's not a pathway. It's, it's a, I don't know. It's, it's like putting them in a legal limbo that's going to make it basically impossible for future presidents to deal with. Like, All right. So let's move on. I think you make a fair point to DAPA, right? Deferred Action for Parental Accountability. God, these acronyms, right? So you have Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and you have Deferred Action for Parental Accountability. <laughs> these acronyms kill you in Washington. So throughout all of 2013 and part of 2014, the Congress debated what's often called comprehensive immigration reform, right? What's comprehensive immigration reform? It will provide it a Halfway to citizenship for roughly 11 million aliens who are in this country unlawfully. Okay, this bill passed the Senate, but it never came up for a vote in the House of Representatives. Okay, why did it not come for a vote in the House? Speaker Boehner said that there were not enough votes. So again, we see that Congress considered a law; they voted against it. They voted it down. What did the president do? Well, instead of campaigning this issue or pressuring Congress, he decided to uh, take matters into his own hands. So this was actually a press conference in the Rose Garden hours after the House announced they would not bring this up for a vote. And the, the president said, I will fix the immigration system my own with or without Congress. So let's focus on this for a second, right? The president acknowledged the immigration system is broken, right? And he says it needs to be fixed. And he does something. Is he, in fact, then executing the laws? 
or is he trying to bypass them? And this is the question of the day, right? So he announced you have DACA, and now we have DAPA. Uh, if you can read this, Deferred Action for Parental Accountability. So what does DAPA do? If you are the parent of a U.S. citizen, and you've been in the country for at least five years, you are now subject to deferrals. You will not be removed. And this applies to somewhere on the order of four to five million aliens, which is roughly 40 to 50 percent of those uh, in this country unlawfully. Okay. While DACA applied to the minors who came here without the mens rea, so to speak, they were brought here by their parents, DAPA applies to people who themselves entered or overstayed unlawfully. And the key is that if these people have had children who are citizens, the parent can gain citizenship through the child. Now, if you know anything about immigration law, if you're not here legally and you have a child, generally speaking, the parent, I'm sorry, the child becomes a citizen by virtue of the 14th Amendment. But the child cannot petition for a visa for the parent until the child turns 21. I don't know if you have any immigration experience. In other words, if someone was traveling to the United States and had a child there, you know, they went to labor while they were you know, touring in Houston, whatever, right? They would have to wait at least 21 years for the child to petition for a visa. And potentially longer, because generally when you're here, Illegally, you have a 10-year bar. You have to leave and come back, which can be waived, but not always. Right? So our Congress has made a very specific decision that parents should not gain citizenship or any kind of legal status through their children because of the 14th Amendment. This uh, provision uh, kind of ignores that part, and it says if you have a child, you can gain citizenship through the child. This is what's often called family unity. Okay? I don't want to get too much into the weeds of immigration law because it's well beyond the scope of our class. Uh, what I will say, though, is that there's been a lawsuit. This is the perfect picture for Texas versus the United States. Texas, your, your, your home state, has filed a lawsuit against the United States over immigration. It's actually filed right here in Brownville, right in the tip, right in the border. What is the basis of Texas's lawsuit? So again, I filed a brief in support of Texas, but I can, I, can, I can do this neutrally, okay? So what's the basis of their lawsuit, right? It's a take care clause, right? And, and th this is a case that was argued two weeks ago, and a, the federal court in Brownsville may issue a decision any day now. I was really hoping it would be by today, but it didn't, didn't work out. I'll provide an update for what happened. Is the president <coughs> complying with the law? Is he actually executing the law? So I'm going to ask the same question I asked before. I asked before, can Congress sue? Here my question is, can the states sue? So should the states be able to sue the federal government for failure to enforce the law? And by the way, it's not just Texas. By this point, there have been 26 other states who have joined this lawsuit. So basically, half the states in the union are now challenging the president on immigration. Should the states, I'm asking, should the states be able to sue the federal government over non-enforcement? Believe it or not, Maine is in the, so is Maine a border state? Where's Canada? <laughs> hey. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I don't have the map in front of you. I think a lot of them are border. Almost, probably almost all of them are border states, and there are a lot in the middle, too. So what, what do you think? So should states be able, should Maine, with, with all those rabid Canadians flooding across the border with their maple syrup and bacon, right? Should, should, should states be able to sue the government for non-enforcement? Damn Yankee land, that's just calling up here. Zachary? 
what it means to significant to the state. There is going to have to say, yeah, this is unconstitutional because it impacts us some way. So what is the basis, right? Yeah, I'm just curious. What is the injury to states? Okay. So a couple of years ago, about six years ago, there was a case called Massachusetts versus EPA. Massachusetts versus EPA. What happened? Massachusetts, which is somewhere in damn Yankee land, I suppose. Oh, snafu, there it is, right there. Massachusetts sued the Bush administration, right? Why did Massachusetts sue the Bush administration? Because they were dragging their feet on different climate change regulations. They were supposed to issue different regulations that would have, uh, you know, prevented climate, you know, pollution and, you know, prevented global warming, whatever. Massachusetts said, because the Bush administration is not taking care of this issue, it will lead to global warming. And because it will be global warming, the seas will rise. And because the seas will rise, it will cause damage to our coasts. Therefore, we have an injury. So effectively, Massachusetts said, the Bush administration is not enforcing environmental laws. In like 30 or 40 years, this will result in global warming. And this will change our borders because the, the waters will rise. What did the Supreme Court say? Yeah, that's an injury. So, the Supreme Court, in a decision that was five to four by Justice Stevens, said states are injured. Their, 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 their sovereignty is injured when the federal government's not enforcing the laws. This is a very bad precedent now that, that I don't think the environmental is quite wanted, but it's on the books. So, Zachary, to answer your question, what's Texas's injury? They argue a couple things, right? They argue that because of this DAPA and DACA, millions of people will now receive uh, some sort of a, a temporary status. And with that status, they're now eligible for work authorization. And because of that work authorization, they can get driver's licenses. Follow me here. And because they can get driver's license, the state's required to pay for the licenses. Now, you may not know this, so I'm assuming most people in this room have a Texas driver's license, okay, and you paid some nominal fee to cover the cost, whatever it's twenty, thirty dollars, whatever it is, right? Believe it or not, that's not the entire cost. It actually costs the state significantly more money to print the cards, do the background check, etc. They they only pass on a small share of the cost to you. Okay, so Texas argued that this is a cost, it's an injury. That because these people are illegally getting work authorization, we now have to give them driver's licenses. We can't deny them driver's license because that would be unconstitutional. Violet Legal Protection Clause. We can't deny aliens licenses if they're allowed to be here. But the, but the licenses themselves are given to people who should not have them. That's the injury. They've also argued that if these uh, the aliens under DAPA apply for work authorization, they have to become a hairstylist or, a, uh, or an engineer or whatever else. You have licensing from the state, and you need to license them. So that's the Texas injury. I don't want to focus too much on injury right now. My question again is, what does it do to the separation of powers to now allow the states to bring suit against the federal government for non-enforcement? What does this do to the separation of powers to allow the states to sue for non-enforcement? Anyone? Come on. How does this impact the balance between the state and the federal government to allow this kind of litigation? Good. What do you mean? Elaborate on that. I mean, to allow the states to challenge the federal government, which is supposed to be the supreme law of the land. You're essentially saying that anything that they disagree with, they can challenge the federal government. So let me push back on that a second. Are they challenging the federal law, or are they asking the federal law to be enforced? I mean, I think they're like, uh, asking for enforced, they're challenging the way that it's being enforced. Who are they challenging? Be very precise. Who are they challenging? Is it the Congress? And here's the issue, and then I'm glad you said that. The states aren't challenging federal law they think is unconstitutional. They think that the immigration laws is just fine. They want the president to enforce the law as it's written. 
right? I'm not necessarily endorsing that argument. What they say is, listen, we're not trying to mess up the separation of powers and give the states too much authority. We're trying to bring the separation of powers back where they're supposed to be. In other words, where the president does not adhere to his duty to take care of the laws are basically executed, a judicial remedy is appropriate to restore the Constitution. Hector, I saw your hand was up. Uh, I think generally it's a good idea to uh, not bar a state from suing the president. Um, because I mean, I could imagine other laws that a president might not want to enforce. I'm not particularly happy about this lawsuit, but in other scenarios, let's say a president didn't want to enforce uh, desegregation laws. Ooh. I think somebody, a state might, might have the same thing. So, uh, but I also think that, um, Anyway, that was, that was that, that's a good point, right? Just your hand up. I was just going to, you know, say it's not like the, the, in this case, I think it's right for the state to be able to challenge because the president isn't like an issue in, in that, but he's not like, I don't know, he's not protecting the, the borders here. So I think it's a domestic issue. I, I don't think he can just assert his power like that on a domestic issue. Well, so I think it's, it's well within Texas' right to do that. Connie. I think the big, the bigger picture for me is if we've got a democracy where the people are having elections and they're sending their representatives to make laws, and yet those are being, that power has been usurped by a president that's making executive orders, you're getting such a tilt that the people are losing their voice. So it's really not a democracy, and it's more of a monarchy. Oh. And so you, I think the, the, the benefit of having a suit like this just puts some sort of checks and balances back because like Hector says, he doesn't really like that. But what if the next president has that same sort of authority and exactly like you said, that power is established. I mean, the, power, the people don't have the power anymore. It's a person that has the power. Brando, set your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think in this case, the states have a little right for clarification. I mean, are they following the laws or are they going to go with the president's personal opinion? Right, right. okay. So let me, let me follow up to a point that Connie made, right? So let's use this example. Let's say in 2016, uh, President Ted Cruz says, <laughs> no, follow me for a second. President Ted Cruz says, you know what? These, these environmental laws, this Clean Air Act, this Clean Water Act, I don't like them very much. So you know what? I'm not going to enforce them. If you're a business in a state and you pollute, I will instruct my agents that this is not a good use of resources and we will not prosecute you. I have much bigger fish to fry. President Rand Paul, 2016, says, you know what? I don't like the corporate income tax very much. I don't like the corporate income tax. I'm not going to enforce it. And if you send me taxes, I will refund them. My agents don't have enough time to audit every corporation. It's a waste of my time. It's not a good use of resources. I want to focus on the bigger fish. Right? Works the other way. President Hillary Clinton in 2016 says, you know what? The law says that in order to get welfare, you have to work. You have to work a certain number of hours a week to get various welfare, right? I don't think that's very fair to people who are hard on their means. I'm just not going to enforce that. I will write welfare checks regardless of whether you work. Okay. President Elizabeth Warren, 2016, right? President Elizabeth Warren says, you know what? We have all these federal loans, right? All these students with federal loans. This is not fair. These, these kids are getting crushed. I'm not going to collect any interest. I'm just going to waive all interest on loans and declare them paid off. Don't clap. I don't want you to clap because I want you to see these are very serious violations of the rule of law because the same power to waive student loans would give President Ted Cruz the power to waive the Clean Air Act. All right. What I want you to see with the faithful execution of the laws is a failure to comply with it does not always have a remedy because people are not being injured. And this is a very bad precedent. Well, did the president like completely stop enforcing the law? I mean, didn't he make it clear so that he would get like, you know, I guess I don't know if it's the worst out or how to like put that, but I mean, it wasn't that he was just ignoring the law. He just kind of like organized it, you know? Right. 
So, so, so with the way DAPA worked, the way it was structured, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of the, the details, but it says, listen, we have certain high priority people, criminals and otherwise, and there are other people who, you know, maybe should be removed, and everyone else shouldn't be. Everyone else should be, you know, where they can stay here, we can defer them. Effectively, 40% of the people subject to immigration laws were, were exempted, right? So I'll give you a modified example. What if President Rand Paul said, you know what? We will only collect the first 10% of, of, of corporate income tax, nothing above that, right? We will let you make you pay 10%, nothing above that. So he's forcing some of it, right? But not all of it. Asking, well, if there's no injury, then you can't bring suit. But the problem is, there may not may not be injury to the person who's getting the benefit, but there are other people who are paying for that. So, mm. those people so there's no taxpayer standing under federal law. The mere fact that you're a taxpayer does not give you an injury to appear in court. Because I can say, man, my tax dollars are being spent in all these dumb programs. Let me go to court. So generally speaking, there's some exceptions to the First Amendment, which don't make much sense. But generally, there's no taxpayer standing. Bottom line, he had the legislation. It didn't pass. I mean, he just, like, he, you, don't, you don't just get to do what you want because you're president. Because Congress didn't enact or doesn't do what he wants. He can't just say, uh, this is the way. I mean, he, he's got to cut his losses at some point and just say no. I mean, you can't do it. I mean, no. I understand I have to have a farm in order to file a lawsuit. I don't understand how, if you've got it right here up on the screen, what it says that if his actions could be argued as unconstitutional, why we have to establish a harm that to me seem like the biggest harm. Is a violation of the Constitution itself a harm? Mm -hmm. Don't see how you could argue that it's a harm. All right, so let's your hand up. No. Bye -bye. So <laughs> the mere fact, so the mere fact the federal courts have said, and we, I didn't cover standing, but if you ever take the class in federal courts, you should. The mere fact that someone violates the Constitution doesn't give you an injury. It's an unfortunate fact, but this is how our law works. Elliot. Um, I just had a question. What is the cause of action in lawsuit? In Texas? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so effectively, they're asking for a declaratory judgment to say that the president's actions are unconstitutional. But more specifically, and this is not what's understood, DAPA wasn't actually an executive order. It's a common misconception. There is no executive order called DAPA. Right? That doesn't exist anywhere, right? What actually happened was the president issued a series of memoranda saying, here's how we're going to reorganize our immigration priorities, right? What they're effectively asking to do is prevent the implementation of those memoranda. In other words, restore the status quo. We're not asking the president to actually do anything, simply hold those memoranda, stop them. Bring it back to what it was before. So this isn't quite an issue of mandamus for making the president do anything. We're simply saying, do what you were doing before. You can't do this new thing by these new memos. Let's focus on the text of the Take Care Clause for a second, right? And again, this, this is somewhat novel. This is my own theory, and uh, it's very likely the Supreme Court will ignore this issue entirely, but you are taking the first ever understandings of how I view this clause. It's, we've, not had to, we've not had to do this before, but I think now we have to do it. So the word take care, right? That sounds familiar to you. It should be something that you did in courts, right? A duty of care. When you have any kind of fiduciary relationship, you generally have some sort of duty to care. You can't act negligently, you can't act recklessly, you have to act reasonably, or maybe faithfully, right? So I think at some level the take care clause imposes a duty on the president, right? It says very clearly, he shall take care. He's imposing a duty that he must. Is there any duty on Congress to enact laws or to confirm people or do anything else? No. If you go look through Article One of your Constitution, the word shall ain't there. It's in like two or three places. There are not many shalls in Article One, but you know who has a lot of shalls? Article Two in the presidency. All, he shall be the commander in chief. He shall take care of the laws of faith the execute. He shall do this. He shall do that. There are a lot of musts. Although the president has a lot of power, it's cabined by requirements. So about the next part, he shall take care that the laws, right? What are these laws? Well, under the supremacy clause of our Constitution, 
what are the supreme laws of the land? Well, the Constitution and the laws of Congress. So in my reading, and again, this is, this is Josh speaking, he has an obligation to enforce the laws of Congress, right? And I would even go a little bit broader than that. When Justice Jackson was looking at the zone of twilight, right, trying to see does the president agree with Congress, he didn't just look at the statute books. He looked at congressional policy. What was voted up? What was voted down? What were the statements made, right? How did Congress approach this issue? I'd be willing to look at broader issues. In the context of immigration, I think it's relevant that Congress voted against the DREAM Act. I think it's relevant that Congress voted against the immigration reform. Why is it relevant? Because the president wanted a certain law to be passed and Congress said no. So the policy of Congress was to not favor certain types of aliens, which is the exact beneficial treatment that was given with DAPA. Okay, what's the third part? Faithfully executed, right? What do these words, faithfully executed, mean? And I put this in the article. Um, this was actually a phrase that was edited a lot during the Constitutional Convention. The original draft of the Constitution, it didn't say faithfully. It said dutifully, right? That the law shall be dutifully executed, right? What does dutifully mean? Well, it means you have some sort of obligation, an obligation which can't really be waived, right? If you have a duty to do something, you have to do it. But the so-called Committee of Style at the Constitutional Convention, which had on it James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, this is, the, this is two thirds of the Federalists, right? They changed the word dutifully to faithfully, right? This was a deliberate move in our Constitutional Convention. Like, what did the framers do? This. What's the significance of the word faithfully? Well, I'm sure you've studied in contracts the, the standard of good faith, right? Yes, you say this in contracts. I think the good faith standard of contracts is an interesting way of looking um, at this issue. And the reason why is because in any contract, you're not always bound strictly by the terms. You sometimes have some wiggle room within the language of a contract. So long as you operate under a good faith basis, right? So say you violate some term of the contract, but it's done in good faith. Maybe you're mistaken, right? In many cases, that's permissible. You have what we might call discretion of how you enforce the law. If a contract imposes a number of duties on you, you may do one thing first and do another thing second, another thing a little bit more than the other. That's fine. So long as you're acting in good faith, there's not going to be a breach. But if you act in bad faith, if you're acting deliberately to bypass the terms of the contract, you're not trying to abide by the contract, but you're acting to deviate from it, then you're in breach then your contractual duty has been violated. And I think this is an important framework to understand the Take Care Clause. And again, this is not in your book. This is not anywhere else. Uh, we've not had to think about these questions because they've never been litigated before. right? In our 200-year history, there have not been lawsuits based on the Take Care Clause by the states or Congress. These haven't happened. So we have to think of new ideas. right? I often give this point to students when I speak on the road, but law school isn't just about memorizing four-factor tests and learning the Hornbook law, right? That, that's fine, that'll get you through the bar. But law school is about forcing you to think of new things that haven't happened yet, right? You have a new legal issue, the answer is not in a book somewhere. Often they will be, but sometimes they're not. This is the skill that pays you the big bucks. This is the skill that actually makes you valid lawyers. Right? And I use this example, which is absolutely true. 
So we'll discuss in about a month the Obamacare case, right? And you may have heard, but the main issue in Obamacare was whether Congress could force you to buy insurance. In other words, can Congress regulate inactivity? You're just sitting there, you're not doing anything. Can Congress make you do something? The Supreme Court said five to four, they cannot. If I were to have asked any of you in 2009, when I, when I graduated law school, in 2009, could Congress make you buy insurance? My answer would have been, of course, why not, right? This is actually a true story. In the fall of 2009, so shortly after I finished law school, uh, there was a meeting of a bunch of lawyers in Washington, D.C., and we were all discussing this new health care law, and we're thinking, oh, man, is there anything we can do to stop it? And then someone asked me, like, Josh, what do you think? I'm like, well, you know, I, Congress can regulate commerce, and insurance is commerce, so of course Congress can regulate a multi-billion dollar industry. But there was a law student, right? He went to Case Western Law School in Cleveland, Ohio. Maybe you've never even heard of it. And he wrote a student note for his law review in 2003 or four. And what did he argue? He said, listen, Congress has all these, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court has all these decisions about regulating economic activity. But the Supreme Court has never regulated economic inactivity. He made this distinction, which no one else saw at the time, that none of the Supreme Court's cases allowed for the regulation of inactivity. This one law review note by a student formed the basis of the biggest constitutional challenge of the 21st century. This is your gift to think of ideas and come up with new things to learn about. All right? So, so take this very seriously. All right. Back, back to here, right? Faithful execution requires good faith. The president doesn't have to apply a robotic, mechanical execution of the law. He has to act faithfully, which does give discretion, as, as Stephanie noted, right? There is discretion to prioritize. But I think where the line can be drawn, or should be drawn, is is the president trying to comply with the law, or is the president trying to evade it? And this is where the good faith standard is helpful. <coughs> and a couple of evidence points, right? Where the president consistently says the law is broken, I want to change it, that doesn't give me very strong belief that he thinks the law is good. And to the extent he's acting consistently with it, there's a presumption that maybe he's not. Um, adding to this fact is that for about a year before this happened, the president said over and over again that he could not defer the deportation of millions of people. He couldn't do it. He lacked the power. But then suddenly, once Congress voted against the bill, he suddenly discovered this power. Uh, in my mind, this is a very bad sign for good faith. Uh, uh, adding to this is the fact that over the summer of 2014, a mere months ago, the New York Times reported that the president went through 60 iterations of DAPA before he finally approved it. Each time he told his lawyers to go further and go further and go further. Right? Again, this doesn't give me a good sense of the president trying to comply with the law. It seems to be trying to push it as far as he could. And then we come now to... DAPA, right? Is this enforcing the law or not? Okay, I won't, I won't bore you with all the details. Okay? I won't bore you with all the uh, vagaries of how um, DAPA works. But suffice to say that if you meet the criteria, right, you have a child as a citizen, you've been here for the whatever number of years, you will get it. <clears throat> Unless you're a felon or something else, you're going to get it. And out of you know the almost 700,000 people who have applied for DACA, almost there's been a 6% denial rate. And of that 6% who was denied, virtually all of them either didn't fill out the paperwork correctly, had a felony of some sort, or didn't meet the criteria. There's not much for an agent, an officer, to have a case-by-case -case basis. And it's turned into what some may call a rubber stamp. Now, this is an issue the government can test fiercely. And you can read their brief. They say, there is discretion. Officers are allowed to consider each person individually. Uh, although my humble reading of the evidence suggests that this is largely a, uh, sort of a mirage or facade. There's no actual discretion. So let's assume I'm right, and maybe I'm not, maybe I am, whatever. But let's assume I'm right for the moment. I'm usually wrong. If I'm right, 
and the president is deliberately acting. Now let's go back to our clause, right? If I'm right, and the president is deliberately acting in a way to bypass the law, he's not faithfully executing the law, then what? Should a court issue an order forcing the president to withdraw the DAPA memorandum? Not, not can they. Is this desirable? Do, what does this do to the separation of powers to now give a federal court the power to interject itself whenever the president's not enforcing the law? Anyone? Hector? Well, can we go back a little bit? Sure. Okay. Please. I would say that um, using your own evidence where you know, he kind of says the laws are broken, these laws are not working, I think it could be construed differently mm -hmm. um, than just a bad faith breach. Mm -hmm. I think um, another way to look at it is that he might be arguing that these uh, laws are violating the due clause, uh, I'm sorry, the um, due process clause of the Constitution. How so? And I'll say that because people are being incarcerated for civil immigration violations, which uh -huh. I think could be argued as a violation of due process. Uh -huh. um, and I think just the system as a whole is not giving people due process for immigration hearings. So if we can just back that up a little bit uh -huh. and kind of put it into your argument of agency and fiduciary, I would say that, uh -huh. um, you know, fiduciaries, they are bound by the contract, but they're also bound by other laws and Mm -hmm. And in this case, I think you would be bound by uh, enforcing other portions of the Constitution. Interesting. And, um, you know, so he's, he can break his agreement, or I guess his duty, if, if it's in furtherance of the Constitution. Ah, so let me ask you this question, Hector, and I think I think your point's very well taken. Does the president have to enforce an unconstitutional law? I don't think he does. Can he enforce an unconstitutional law? He should not. Who gets to decide whether it's unconstitutional? Well, Oh, who get? No, let me ask the question again. So I, th I think I think I agree with you. The president does not have to enforce an unconstitutional law. Who gets to decide whether a law is unconstitutional? Who gets to decide whether a law is unconstitutional? Yes, sir. If you're executing the law, you should make that decision for yourself. So the president takes it upon himself to decide the law is unconstitutional. Unless told otherwise. What if the courts don't agree with him? Well, I mean, that's a different question. But I think it, it, um, it's just another argument to say that perhaps he's not acting in bad faith, okay. but rather he's acting in good faith for the Constitution. So he has an argument here the immigration laws are unconstitutional, but he has a very good point, right? Elliot? I was just going to add on to what Hector is saying. I uh, would <clears throat> say that uh, perhaps he was actually being good faith in furtherance of the Constitution as a whole document rather than this particular clause, in that it's pretty unrealistic to say that Which part? Which part of the Constitution is he acting in pursuance of then? Well, who un, under the Constitution? One, one at a time, please. Under the Constitution, who makes the naturalization laws? So then, who gets to decide who are the people? Yes. So, and the president's never asserted the power to decide who a citizen is, right? That, that's a power reserved to Congress in the 14th Amendment, right? And then Article 1, Section 8. But I think you're on an interesting point, right? Also, would you hand up? Uh, yes, I was just going to say that I, I felt like he was still making decisions and taking power away from the voters. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a Well, he has term limits, so he has another, another 18 months, oh, but yeah, so yes. Okay. So the tyranny. Um, I was just going to say, technically, isn't he still technically executing the laws because he is um, the president who has supported the most people in the current year, so he's still following the INA. And what I'm thinking is that since these are just memoranda, they're memos, 
Doesn't he have the discretion to decide how he's going to execute the laws? And he's not giving them a, like a right to citizenship or a path to citizenship. He's just kind of deciding who he's going to deport first, let's say, mm -hmm. concentrating on the criminals and not the families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, th th that's a perfectly fair argument. That's what the government's arguing in this case. Um, uh, the response to that is <laughs> the discretion given to my Congress hasn't reached this far. In other words, although Congress only gives him the power to deport 400,000, he doesn't have the discretion to waive it for, for 4 million, right? There's the, Congre the, the president only has, right? You mentioned the INA. That's Immigration and Naturalization Act. And this is our big immigration law. It's this humongous law that I don't want to bother you with, right? But it gives the president some discretion over who to deport, who not to, but there are certain limits. And in the past, all forms of broad deferred action have been tied to certain statutory regimes. So for example, I'll, I'll give you a good example. So after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of the universities in the Gulf Coast shut down, right? They, 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 they had to shut down. What if you were a foreign student on a student visa at, say, Loyola, New Orleans? You couldn't register for classes because your school was shut down. If you're a student with a student visa and you can't register for classes, you are now here unlawfully, right? You're not here lawfully. So what happened? President Bush deferred the deportations for three or four months to allow the students to register at other universities and apply it to maybe a couple thousand aliens in the, in the Gulf Coast, right? So that was an instance where the president deferred deportation for a fairly temporary measure for a very specific lim uh, reason. These deferrals aren't for people who have status waiting on their side, right? There's not a bridge between your student, Katrina, student, right? There, there's that little gap there. Here, it's meant to actually, perhaps, give these people a couple years until Congress perhaps changes the laws. So while there is no conferral of legal status, the purpose of this is simply to push off deportations in the hope that future Congress will change the law. And again, that doesn't necessarily make it unconstitutional. Maybe that's within the president's discretion. That's what the court will have to decide. I don't pretend that this is an easy issue. Right? I, I don't think that, even though I filed a brief in this case, I think it's right. This is not an easy case. So I hand somewhere over there. What's our remedy? This is this is new stuff. The court hasn't even ruled yet. You guys are like arguing over a summary judgment motion. I'm not I'm not I'm not exaggerating. What's what's the remedy? Injunction for what? The argument that you pose at the end of this is the last tier of faithfully good faith versus bad faith. Right. And if you're not acting within the good faith, how can that be Okay, so what's the remedy? And how, how do we do that? How do you repeal something that's not a law? Injunction. What, say it, Jason? Injunction. It's an injunction against the memoranda. So effectively, yes, the remedy would have to be the president cannot enforce these memoranda. Zachary. That's true. There are also more immigrants here than were in the past. I mean, that number doesn't mean so much because there's usually more immigrants. As I'm saying, you know, as there are more people in the country, there's more to deport. Yeah. Right. I know that, that that's the argument, right? It's a very absolutist to say that. No, and, and you're right. He is enforcing significant portions of the law. Right? There will still be roughly 400,000 people deported annually. The question is, what about conferring various benefits to other people? Is that consistent with the law? The problem isn't how many people he's deporting. It's how many people he's preemptively saying he will not deport, and whether that's consistent with the Take Care Clause duty. And again, this is, this is a tough question. And you see often in the news this thing called executive amnesty, which is not accurate. It's not even close. But there are benefits being conferred on people who perhaps the law does not recognize as those receiving benefits. I think one of the stronger arguments, too, and you touched upon it, and it was in the brief, too. I really like the analogy of the Katrina and how it was a bridge short term, and how now it's like a tunnel. Like, it's, they're trying to basically, he's trying to tunnel under instead of just creating a short term bridge to fix a problem like Katrina so the students could register to, you know, to get back into school. He's creating a tunnel, like you said, so hopefully Congress could change a lot in the future. You say that the 
assume the law doesn't recognize them and give them these rights, et cetera. I mean, what's, how's that argument or that approach based the fact that a lot of people now are immigrants, pay tax, not all of them, a lot of them pay taxes. I mean, in Texas alone, they pay paid $424 million more than they were services spent on them, uh -huh. which is a state. And so the government can take our tax dollars and take tax dollars by not being immigrants and use it for whatever, but they're not afforded any relief or rights or... That's the law. I mean, that's the law Congress it's passed. Curious, it's just a curious spectrum where we can take the money for services that they provide, like construction, building services, and yet still deny them. I think you're making very valid policy arguments, and that'd be something for Congress to remedy. <coughs> yeah. What I personally don't like about this is the, the pitch that it puts, like, the law, the, I don't know if I said this. I don't like that it comes down to that you want these people to be out or whatever. I don't like that personally. I mean, I love being in Texas and being in San Antonio where it's Tex-Mex. I love that. I mean, that's part of my heritage. I would move from that. So I don't like that that energy is interjected in this, you know, personally. It puts a racial thing that I don't like. I can just sense it. And I don't like so, that. So, and so I you're feel that that... Honestly, I feel that that's part of the purpose here. So, so what's interesting, and I think you both raised very fair points, mm -hmm. is that these constitutional issues are very, very, very personal. Yes. Extremely personal. Exactly. Let me tell you something. In this class, I promise you, I will offend you at some point. <laughs> I promise you. And if you don't want to be offended, go to a different class. Right? The reason why you will be offended is that often courts Executives, legislatures do things you do not agree from a policy perspective. I'll give you another example, Obamacare, right? The court's deciding a case this term on Obamacare. And if the court rules a certain way, roughly 34 million people in states will lose various subsidies to make their insurance unaffordable. That's not a small deal, <coughs> right? I, I followed a brief in this case saying that the government's policy has been unconstitutional. I fully recognize that as a result of this, people may be worse off. But what I ask you at the beginning of class, what I want you to do in this class, is to the extent you can separate yourself from the policy. Don't forget about the policy, but try to look at the law by itself. You can always remember your policy and argue about it with me and you know during class or after class. But try to look at the issues in the abstract. Because there are going to be some issues where you maybe like the policy but think it's unconstitutional. And there will be other issues where you hate the policy but think it's constitutional. I like the DREAM Act. I support it. I think it's a good piece of legislation. Right? I support the Comprehensive Immigration Reform. I think it's a good piece of legislation. And were I a member of Congress, I would vote for it in one second. But that doesn't cloud my judgment about whether I think it's unconstitutional or not. And to give you a little bit more backing, I filed a brief on behalf of the Cato Institute, which is a... Uh, uh, a libertarian uh, uh, think tank. Right, it's a libertarian think tank that files uh, briefs in different cases. The Cato Institute is taking the position that DAPA is good policy, but it's unconstitutional. And that's fairly rare that you see this. <coughs> okay? All right. Any other questions? All right. There's actually an event today at noon. Um, uh, the, the school's federal site is having an event today at, uh, it's like maybe the exact time. It's at uh, 11 o'clock, I'm sorry, uh, up in the library on the sixth floor. And one of my professors from George Mason, Nathan Sales, is giving a talk on drones and national security. There'll be free lunch. So if you're interested, check it out. It's at, I think it's at 11 o'clock. I'm sure there are flyers around. Go to the um, uh, library. I think you will really enjoy it. All right. Thank you all so much for a very good lecture. I appreciate it. Have a good day.